Check, check, check. Isn't this creepy? I mean, no, creepy in a weird kind of cool way. Yeah, it's like doing an infinite screenshot of it. Yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly what it is. Uh, okay. So if you go down, so again, this is on our Canvas site under resources for uh, session number one. Under support, there's a thing called file naming best practices. This is a file naming convention that I've actually, I invented this, uh, I invented it. I, I did it years ago, whatever. And over the years, it's surprisingly shocking how uh, um, there's all sorts of, of um, groups out there that design what they call best practices for everything. So best practices for naming, best practices for color managed workflow, best practices for this, that, and the other. Um, anyway, this is a, a small variation on it. I do something slightly different than a lot of the other ones do. However, I'm going to throw this out to you guys right now. So far, my guess is through photo, well, you guys didn't have photo practice one and two, did you? You had foundations one and two, right? Right. And they told you to name your assignments like F1 underscore bot last name, whatever. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> Can you tell anything from that about your work? Much less, it is your work, right? And the fact that you shot it for an assignment shouldn't mean that on for some reason it should be hobbled by the fact that it was made for an assignment. The fact that you have named it, that is wrong on every level. So what I'm going to say to you is this. I'm going to show you the naming convention that I use. You do not have to use this naming convention. However, I have done this class or classes similar to this for a while now. Well, actually, you're really my first class. Can, I, can you tell? I'm really nervous. I've never taught before, so I'm scared. I, I, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I've never known, I, there, and I'm sure there are students who've never done this, but I've never known one not to do this, not to embrace this, because here's the deal. The naming convention that I'm going to give for you will bring order to your life. Yes, because how many images do you guys typically shoot in a year? Do you have any idea? A typical shooting day for me in the studio is 600 images. I do that five days a week. That's 3,000 a week times 52. That's almost 200,000 images. And that's just what I shoot in the studio. That's nothing of my own, right? I mean, this stuff can get out of control in a way that you just, you just, you can't manage it anymore. Uh, and, and you go to want to find something and you just give up. So what I'm hopefully going to do is give you a system and a structure to avoid that. But another thing that matters in this, and this is what I say to you now, because is, is this, is that whatever naming convention you do, I don't care what it is, but you need to do it from this point on for the whole rest of your lives. Because if you decide, okay, I'm going to do one naming convention today, but two years from now, I'm going to change it. You are fucked. Because your whole naming convention for two years is going to be different than your whole new plan. So the whole idea is that you need to come up with one that you're going to use tonight. So whatever it is, I'm going to offer you up mine, and I'm going to tell you why I do mine and the way mine works. You guys can do what you want, but I'm telling you right now, if you do nothing, this problem is only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Are we good on this? So this is the naming convention that I do. You were, well, Again, this PDF exists there. You can copy this down. You can see it exists right here. It's this little, uh, uh, this thing right here. And I realize that that looks really, really, really long, whatever. But I'm going to explain everything that's in here. This whole thing will explain it to you so you don't need to memorize this or put notes down here. But so I'm going to explain to you how this thing evolved, why it evolved, the way it does evolve, and what you can actually take away from it and keep in mind about this. Again, I don't care what naming convention you use, but whatever one you use, you better decide on it tonight, and that's what I expect you to use from now on. Now, you are going to turn in assignment files to me that are named differently, but that's a completely different issue. So you're going to turn in a Photoshop file to me that doesn't have this naming on it. But this is what you want to use for all of your raw file capture ingesting for the rest of your lives. Are we good on this? So it starts out with this, four-digit code. It is the year. Now, 
I don't know how old most of you guys are, but I'm going to say, guess you're probably in your 20s or close about something in like that, right? So there is a good chance that every file that you're going to shoot for the whole rest of your life is going to start with 2-0 because it's the year. And again, so we're in 2018 right now. I don't think many people here are going to get to 2101. You might, but that would put you over 100. So a lot of people say, well, what? So you don't need the 2-0. The 2-0 is in front of everything. You don't need that part of the year. The problem is, is without it, there are... There's confusion. Is the first two letters of your naming convention a month or a year? Is 18 a day? You don't know what it is. So if you've got the 2018, which is what it would start out for today, there's no question about how this works. Are we good on this? The next two codes are your month, and then the last two codes are the day. It's always this way. It's year, month, day. If you do that, Every single thing you shoot will be in chronological order for the rest of your life. Because everything that you shoot then, what gets attached on the very end of this, is going to be your frame number. And your frame number is going to constantly count up. So everything that you shoot, if you use this, will be in chronological order for the whole rest of your life. Always. That's impressive. Some people, unfortunately, here in the United States are used to doing uh, dates with the month first and then the day and then the year. If you do that, then all of your Septembers will be together. All of your Januaries will be together, and you will hate your life. Because instead of looking for the files that you shot last January, you're looking at all your Januaries. Does this make sense? So there's no real exception to this. It's always year, month, day. Underscore, then I've got a three-digit code. That three-digit code on mine is CCC. That actually is supposed to stand for client. For me, because I'm a commercial photographer, I need to establish who I'm shooting for. It's just a quick reference. If I'm shooting for myself, that code is DER. If I'm shooting for Neiman Marcus, it's NIE. If I'm shooting for Saks, it's SAK. If I'm shooting for General Motors, it's GEM. It's a quick three-digit code that tells me who it was for, and it's really, really, really fast, right? So again, for Columbia College, you could do CCC. The next one, and these are separated by underscores. These underscores are critical. You, they're in the naming convention. There's a whole lot of illegal characters. You can't have forward slashes. You can't have question marks. You can't have periods until you get to the very end. There's all sorts of illegal characters that exist, and I think I've got them in here somewhere. But nonetheless, these underscores are important to actually separate this so it makes sense to you. The next thing that follows in here is keywords, plural. The reason it is plural is keywords is eight letters long. That's all you get for your keywording. You can use less than eight letters, but you cannot use more. So you count it out, K-E-Y-W-O-R-D-S, eight characters, that's it. So for me, the keyword that I put in when I'm shooting, for instance, if I'm shooting for Lord and & Taylor and I'm doing beauty, it's L-O-R underscore beauty. If I'm shooting Lord & Taylor kids, it's L-O-R underscore kids. If I'm shooting Lord & Taylor fashion women, it's L-O-R fashion. Does this make sense where we're going with here? So it's a quick reference. I can look at a file. I know when I shot it. I know who I shot it for. And I know basically what it is. There was a guy who was teaching to the entire faculty Lightroom. His file naming convention, he would start it with his subject matter, flowers. Flowers. He shoots flowers every day of his life, all day long, whatever, for years. Flowers? That's just a clusterfuck. That is a nightmare. This is structure and order. Uh, okay, then finally, there's another underscore here. There's a two-digit code here. For me, the two-digit code is the shot that I'm actually doing. So in fashion photography, a typical given day, I will shoot 15 different outfits. So it'll be 15 dresses or 15 suits or something like that. Each one of those is a separate shot. So this is a way for me to code a different shot. Does that make sense? It's always two digits. It's never one. It's always two. So for my first shot, it's zero, 01. For my second shot, it's zero, 02. My third is zero. That way, when I get to 11, it will stay in order. If you only used 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 11 then would go between 1 and 2, which again throws things out of order. So it's always a two-digit code. Now, 
There are people who have said to me, well, Verser, I don't do shots like that. And I always say to them, you don't have to do it. You could always just put in an O1 here and just leave it at that. But think about if you're a wedding photographer and you're shooting weddings, right? Your shot O1 could be the church. Your shot O2 could be the, the, um, the reception. Your shot O3 could be the honeymoon. You know, I mean, you can break it up. You can think about trying to break your days up in something that's a little bit more manageable if that's what you want to do. If you're shooting over a number of days, that could be a day count. So you could be saying, okay, well, this is day 01 or day 02. Does that sort of make sense? Are we good on that? And then the three-digit code that follows this, these three numbers right here, that's your frame count. So again, what this will give you is up to 999 frames. You can't go to 1,000. That's why the shot, O2, the two-digit shot counter matters in this. Does this make sense to you guys? Are we good on this? And then finally, are there any questions about this? Then finally, this dot .exp, that's the extension. What is the extension? Well, it's what you shoot. So how many people in here are Canon shooters? How many are Nikon shooters? Sony shooters? Okay, so if you are a Canon shooter, that extension code is CR2. If you're a Nikon shooter, it is NEF. And if you're a Sony shooter, it is an AW... What the hell is AWR, ARW? Is it ARW? Yeah, ARW. That's what that extension code is. Why does this matter? The reason this matters is, is that those are your raw files, right? You process your raw file and you make a Photoshop file of it. Do you change the name? No, you just change the code, the extension. So it keeps the exact same name, but this dot changes to a PSD for your Photoshop file. If you make a TIFF, this is a dot TIF. If you make a JPEG, this is a dot JPG. No matter what you make out of it, the name stays the same, so they all stay connected. So you don't have some Photoshop file that you have no idea what the fuck you made this thing from, where on earth that raw file is, what raw file it is, you don't have a clue, so you're in there searching. How many people have done this? It is awful. It is a nightmare. You're back there searching for shit, and you cannot find it. It is a nightmare that I'm trying to avoid. Are we good on this? Any questions about this? Okay, so again, I don't care what one you do, but do one. Okay, if really quickly, we need to go into Lightroom now. So if you can just launch Lightroom. How many people in here are doing Lightroom in the cloud? Are you doing both or just strictly cloud? Okay. It doesn't matter. i, I got to be perfectly honest with you. I don't do cloud-based stuff. Um, I know way too many people who have been burned too much doing uh, cloud-based stuff. Um, so uh, whatever I show you guys in this is going to be through the CC version of Lightroom, which is the localized version. Okay. Um, pictures of Africa. Not that that matters. Okay, I want to go through a quick series of exporting to just show you guys what it is I'm talking about to build all this stuff. So in doing what, at least the way I remember Foundations 1 and 2 used to go, do you guys have an external hard drive that has got your Lightroom catalog on it? Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody not have that? Yes, I don't have it. What? Okay, we should talk about that. I have, I have got, so far, I have got like about a six out of ten record for rescuing crashed hard drives. Don't count that. I can't promise you anything, but um, yeah, I'm actually, anyway. Do you have it backed up? No. Okay, we should have that discussion right now. How many people in here back up their work religiously? How many don't? So for all those people with your hand up with the don't part, you don't care about your work. That's all I can say. Uh, you'll lose it. You, you will lose it. My backup system is so expensive, you, you would be shocked. Yes, we actually can't go over that in class. Yeah, yeah, a really good, safe backup process, yes. Yes, we'll do all that. We'll do all of that. Somebody shoot me an email right now saying we need to talk about backing up strategies, and we'll try and get to it next week. Uh, okay, so I just want to go through importing really quickly. I've given you something to import, and that is the compact card imitation file. So 
we don't really have a bunch of card readers here, so I'm just using that. It's a bunch of raw files that are simply there. Uh, and so we're just gonna, I just wanna go through the motions to make sure that everybody's comfortable with this. If you have an external hard drive and you wanna do I don't, they're my files. You don't need to import this into your Lightroom catalog. I just wanna make sure that everybody has got some understanding that there's no question about how we import and name and do that whole stuff in, in, in Lightroom, okay? So this is hopefully gonna be the last time I talk about Lightroom with you guys and we'll go from there. Are we good on that? All right, so the uh, uh, folder I ask you to copy to your desktop that's called uh, Compact Card uh, Imitation. That's the one we're going to import. We're actually not going to import it, to be really honest with you. We're just going to go to the final steps before you hit the button, and we'll stop there. So to do that, in Lightroom, you start Lightroom up. You come up to the File menu, down to Import Photos and Videos. It would be great if you guys did this whole thing with me. Then you actually need to select the source. If you take a look in this drop-down menu over here, you can navigate to it. In my case... I don't know where I put mine, so let me check on mine really quick. I'm going to just throw mine on my desktop so it's like yours. Okay, so mine's on my desktop. So in this source over here, if you click and you open up your desktop, it'll be under your users. There should be a thing that says compact <coughs> card, flashcard imitation. If you click on that, <clears throat> it should populate your screen with a series of photographs me in the beginning and a girl named Bailey. This is actually from a, um, a class from a... This is either a fashion class or an assisting class. But nonetheless, does everybody have this guy up? We good on this? When this stuff comes in, everything will automatically be selected for you. <clears throat> if you want to only cherry pick the images that you want to import, you would click on uncheck all. That gets rid of the check marks that are on all of them. And then you can go through and you can pick ones just by clicking on check marks in, in between them. So you don't have to import everything. But in my case, I am going to import everything. So I'm going to click on check all again. And they all become highlighted. So the way that Lightroom import is designed to work is you are supposed to follow this pathway. So we have picked where it's coming from right here, and you'll see there's a little arrow that points right here that moves us into the middle section. And in this middle section, we control exactly what happens to our raw files. So you have options. You can click on copy as DNG, and what that would do would be it would make a copy of your raw file, convert it to a DNG, and move it into the folder that we designate in this final step over here. I strongly suggest you not do that. There's no great advantage to doing that. How many people in here are working with DNG? Anyone? No, there's nothing. There's upsides to it. There are actually things that we're going to do with DNGs. I'm just trying to figure out where you guys are at. Why do you work with DNG? Okay. We are unlearning that right now. I piss more people off than you can imagine. So at any rate, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> at any rate, so that's what copy DNG will do. I'm going to skip over copy right now. What move will do is it will actually move your raw files to another place. It will also load references to them in your, um, uh, uh, in your, um, um, uh, uh, um, what am I trying to say, in your Lightroom database. And then add, and add, what add does is that add not only will load references to this to your database, it will actually copy your raw data and it will put it inside of Lightroom, which is a problem because then your Lightroom catalog balloons to this gigantic size. It's really more like uh, true cataloging and it's not where we want to go in this guy, okay? So in our case, and this again should be the very same workflow that they are using in Foundations 1 and 2, if you look at our um, uh, Canvas site really quickly, let me just go back, uh, again under resources here for week uh, session number one, um, so if you forget all of everything that I'm telling you right now and you don't want to bother to watch the video, 
Again, if you go under support right in here, it's right down here, Lightroom importing. If you click that open, it's the whole recipe for what I'm showing you right now. I just want to go through this. So just know that this exists there if you get lost or you don't remember, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So at any rate, we are going to copy this because what copy does is this. It's going to add a reference to the Lightroom database but it's also going to move your files off of the compact flash card, which is a good thing for you. You don't want to leave it on your compact flash card, and it's going to move it to a place that you designate. So if you set up your folder structure the way they suggested that you do, I'm going to show you what mine looks like. This is what got suggested in the Foundations classes, is that in your pictures folder, you would have a Lightroom library. Again, you can just I'm more than willing that you can take this with a grain of salt and build this the way you want it, but this is the way it was suggested to be built in Foundations 1 and 2. You would have a Lightroom library that sat inside of your pictures partition. Inside of this, you would have a folder called Camera Files. You would have another one called Catalogs and another one called Exports. You probably do not have this one called Master Copies. And inside of these folders, Inside of camera uh, files is where all of your raw files sit. Inside of catalogs, these are your different various, di various different catalogs. In most cases, you should probably only have one of these. Uh, and then finally, in exports, these are where you actually export catalogs. This is where you will export um, the catalogs that you're going to turn into me for assignments. So they've asked you to build this structure. So this is the structure that I'm going to believe you have built. Uh, if not, then you need to adapt this given the information that we're going to go over here and what's inside the PDFs. Are we good on that? Because if you don't have this thing set up, I'm not taking the time out now for you to build it. Are we good on that? Okay, so back here into Lightroom. Copy is, the, is what you do want to pick to actually have happen. Now over here, again, you follow the little arrow over, and you are going to click on this drop-down menu right here, and you are going to pick Other Destination, and you are going to navigate to that Camera Files folder. Again, this is where we are going to put raw files. This is where those guys exist. So for me, the raw files that I'm going to stick in here if you look at my uh, 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 raw file, the stuff that I've actually got over here, I'm going to actually jump out of this really quickly, guys, and I'm going to take a look at one thing really fast. If I look at that, uh, at the raw files themselves, they were actually shot on. Oh, give me a favor. Please start my sign sheet. Uh, they were shot on uh, 2001.6.1008. Uh, What's going to be the file naming convention that I use for this set of images? Anybody? Close, but not quite. Say what? No, it would not be for today. It's when this was shot. Exactly. Does that make sense? So the naming, if you take a look at this date right here, they were done in 2016 on October 8th. That matters, okay? So what I'm going to do here, back in my Lightroom folder, in my little drop-down menu, I'm picking the destination, where to copy these raw files. I'm going to say Other Destination. I'm going to navigate to those raw file, uh, to my Camera Files folder, this guy right here, Camera Files folder. I'm going to click on new, file, a new folder to actually put these into, and I'm going to give it that name, 20161008 underscore CCC, because this was for Columbia College, uh, underscore, and I'm going to put in here, assist, because it was for my assisting digital tech workshop. That's my keyword. Does that make sense? And then I'm going to simply hit create. That's going to put a folder in here that has got the name of the shooting that I have done. Are there questions about this? Uh, because this is the folder. Everybody else is going to be put in with the actual shot and the file name. So I get to the rest when I name the files. 
You'll see in a second. Okay, so I'm going to say choose that one. That's the one that I want to actually put this in. Under File Handling, I'm going to simply build Standard Previews. If you click on this drop-down menu, you can build other ones. Standard is a good compromise. It's not too big. It's not too small. How many people in here actually do all of their editing in Lightroom? How many people in here would like to be able to do their editing in Lightroom and not actually have to have the raw files attached? So, is your Lightroom catalog probably, your Lightroom catalog probably sits in your internal hard drive of your computer, right? It's on your external? Okay, well, all of that's fine, all of that's fine, but I'm just saying, if you're the kind of person that works, keeps your Lightroom catalog on your computer, but has all your raw files on an external hard drive, if you use this option right here, build smart previews, what happens is you can develop your files without having access to your raw files. And then what will happen is, so let's say, for instance, I put all of my raw files on an external hard drive. I leave the hard drive at home. I'm here at school. I want to work on those files. Well, the hard drive with all the raw files is at home, so the develop module is not available to me. I can look at my previews in the library, but the develop module is not available to me. Unless you click on that Build Smart Previews, what Build Smart Previews does is it will make a very small preview that you can do your edits on. Then when you plug your hard drive back in when you get home, it automatically will update all the edits onto the raw files of your hard drive. <laughs> the Lightroom catalog has to be on your internal hard drive. And your, everything else is on all your raw files because your raw files are going to build over time. Eventually, you'll end up with terabytes. You're not going to be carrying that on. You're not going to be carrying around, you know, the big old. So eventually, this is going to have to happen. Are we good? All right, so I'm going to click on Build Smart Previews. You need to do this for this class anyway. Do not import suspected duplicates you want. You are not going to make a second copy here. This would be a very bad way to actually do a backup. And we do not need to click Add to a Collection right now. You can do all of that later. However, we are going to rename these files. So you need to click on the thing that says <coughs> Rename Files. In the drop-down menu underneath this, you're going to click on this drop-down menu and come down to Edit. And we are going to build a new template that's going to be named exactly what this guy is. I'm going to simply drag through this guy and get rid of mine. And we now type in, again, that file naming, 20161008 underscore ccc underscore assist, A-S-S-S-T underscore. Now, this would be a case where I can put in my shot number, we only did one shot that day, so I'm going to put in 01 underscore. Then we're going to actually add a counter to this. So in this, I've got an import counter right here. I'm going to say I want a three-digit import number, and it gets inserted right here. And then finally, I need to add the sequence. I need to add, um, I think it's going to keep, it looks like the extension is going to still be on here. It actually is. So this is my custom name. Now, some people would say, well, then you should save this as a template. To do that, I would come up here and come down and save current saving, savings as a new preset. However, every one of my shootings is going to be new. There's no reason to have presets. I would never name anything this way again. My next shooting is going to take on a different date and a different subject and a different client. So there's no reason to save this. So I'm simply going to say done. You would click on this drop down to leave extension as is. And you can see this is the sample right down here that this thing is going to get named. And it's exactly what I want. Does this make sense? The Canon RAW file. If you if these were NEF file, if this was Nikon, they would be NEF. If they were uh, Sony, again, they would be AR, ARW. It's ARW or AWR. I don't remember which one. Okay, are we good on this? The final thing, and this is where everybody screws this part up. We're going to keep going down here. In terms of developed settings that you can apply during import, you don't want to do any of these. In terms of the metadata, you do want to click on this. And we are going to come down to New... 
And the new preset you're going to do is your copyright. How many people in here have a preset of their copyright? Do you have one for 2018? All right, good. Well, we're going to make one anyway. So I'm going to do this uh, copyright. So I know what this whole thing is. Down here, the where we actually need to put this information is going to be this copyright right down here. So in the copyright under this IPTC uh, information down here, if you hold down your option key and hit the letter G, you will get the copyright symbol. And then you would put in 2018. Even though this was shot in 2016, I would still want to copyright it again for this year. Copyright. Uh, and then you would put in your own name. In this case, you would put in my name because these are my images. Uh, copyright status. This does not matter as much anymore as it used to matter. Um, these things used to be, you would have to declare these. So because we are listing it as copyrighted, we are going to put it as copyright. And then again, in rights right here, again, th the copyright laws have gone sort of far beyond this. You don't have to uh, establish rights in here. However, you could throw in here uh, all rights reserved or, or, or you, know, you can actually put in language here. We don't need to do that. Down here, you could also put in the creator type address. You can put in all of this information. I would probably do that if I were you, but I'm just saying. So, But I'm not going to go through all of that right now. I am going to, though, say create this guy. It is now put that in. It exists right here. So all of these are going to be stamped with that copyright. How many people in here keyword? This would be a place where you would put in your keywording for this stuff. So again, in keywording, I would do girl. I would do available like, Columbia College, assisting class, all the keywords that you wanted to put in. Every keyword that you put in has to be separated by a comma, but the advantage to doing this now is that it will keyword every file that you bring in. So if I import a thousand of these, I don't have to go back and keyword each one individually. Make sense? But I'm going to avoid, I'm going to move on in keywording right now. I am not going to put this into a subfolder. In terms of the organization right down here, if you click on this drop down menu, you will see by original folders, by date, or into one folder. There's only one option here to use, and that is into one folder. You want all of this to go in to that raw camera folder that we set up here at the top. Does this make sense? You do not want to sort this stuff by date. You've just stamped this with a date. You don't want to put this into original folders. No, I don't want that. That'll actually grab the folder that's on your compact disc card and recreate that name in here, all of which is just confusing. Are we good on this? Okay, you guys don't need to do this. I'm going to show you what mine looks like. Uh, the reason I say don't do it is otherwise it's going to put all of this, these, it's going to put all these images in your Lightroom catalog, and you really don't need them in there. I just wanted to go through this. So, but anyway, I'm going to click on import. <clears throat> And it will actually go through a little thing, and it is importing these guys right now. And you can see they are all existing right here. If I click on one of these, you can see its name right down here got stamped with that. What can you tell me about just looking at the name of this file? What can you tell me about this file? Mm -hmm. What else can you tell me about it? What else? Not the assisting thing means a lot to you, but it means a lot enough to me, right? I would get that part. Um, shot number one, what frame was this in my shooting? Yeah, that's actually weird here. I clearly hit something wrong in this part right here. But my smart previews have now actually been built again, but you guys get where this whole thing is going, right? Are there questions <laughs> about this? Okay, finally, and this is the last thing that I need to show you guys right here is... <clears throat> how to make a collection to export this, because this is ultimately what you're going to have to do after next week, okay? is I'm, I don't want to see everything that you export, I mean that you, that you shoot. So you go out and shoot 200 pictures. I don't want to see 200 pictures. I want to see your top 10 or your top 20. That's all I want to see. So to get to that, you would actually go through these things, and you can cherry pick things. You can, If you click on the first one, hold down the Shift key and click any other, it selects all the ones in between. If you hold down the first one, click on the first one, hold down the command key, that's the key just to the left of the space bar, you can cherry pick these things so that they don't all come in, so that they're not, uh, everything is all selected. But once you get the number that you actually want to um, uh, select, you can come over here to collections. I'm going to click on this plus drop down menu to create a new collection. 
in the new collection that I create, I'm going to name this collection using the assignment naming that I gave you in the assignment on Canvas. So remember, if we go look at our Canvas site and you look at the very top, this is it exists in every single folder. So I'll just go to the uh, the naming convention right here so we can go through this and see. You'll see that right here, so remember in this you're going to name this catalog last name underscore first name underscore assignment number. Now you're not changing the name of your raw files, you're just this is what you're going to turn in to me. Does this make sense? So your collection is going to have this name. So again, this is assignment 1.2. So back in Lightroom, I would call this Engelhard underscore Verser underscore 1.2. And then I'm going to say to include the selected photos. It's just an easy way to do it. I've selected these photos. It will do all the work for me. I'm going to hit Create. You'll see the collection exists right here. It's only those four photos. So then when I go to export this thing, I'm going to click on this button. It's going to ask me where I want to export this thing to. Actually, I take that back. That's not how I'm going to do this. I'm going to come up to the File menu down to Export as Catalog. Not this export here. This will export the original raw copies of the original raw file. That's not what I want to do. I actually want to come up to the File menu export is catalog a dialog box will open it up and say what do you want to call this I'm gonna call it the name of that catalog which was Engelhard underscore verser underscore 1.2 that's my, again last name first name you would think I could spell my name by now you'd be wrong in the export catalogs that's what this was created for is another just dialog box for where these things should actually go this is critical right here this do not export the negative files that will give me copies of your raw file your catalogs will be too big and I will get these jag I had somebody do this last year they kept exporting their entire Lightroom catalog to me every time uh, and they were um, I was getting six gigabytes at a shot don't do that. I will spank you. You do want to click on this build include smart previews. You've already done yours. This is the only thing you actually need to include in this guy and then click on export catalog. It's going to say you've used this already two times or I'm going to put a two on the end of it because I've already exported one of these. I'm going to say sure fine go ahead and do that guy. It's going to export the catalog and then this is what you are going to turn into me next week in pictures in my Lightroom library. Can you tell them from the south? The library. Uh, it's this guy right here. Are there questions about this? We good? All right, if I have anything to say about this, we're never going to go into Lightroom again, although we're going to have to, but nonetheless. We will tomorrow, uh, next week, because I'm going to do this with you guys, okay? Oh, okay, so did everybody get on the sign-in sheet? Did that make it all around? Is everybody on this guy? So I do this every week at some point. <clears throat> Try to. Okay. Do what? Oh, yes. You didn't know that that's how I really make a living on the side? Uh, okay, so we got through all of that part. All right, so we're going to get to the final color manage workflow part, and uh, hopefully we're going to have time to get through all of this. So, <clears throat> so far, you guys have been working with what I call, like, training wheels on, and I'm getting ready to take them off. So we're moving into the big times now. So hopefully you're going to find this. I, I want to fundamentally change your life and how you make photography right now. So you remember I promised you the part about color, right? I said that we're going to get your color management worked out. 
we are also going to get your color management in a way that you probably never imagined was actually possible, but we're going to do that. Um, but I'm also going to get exposure worked out. I think exposure may be a little ambitious for tonight, so we will get to that next week. But we are definitely going to go through color managed workflow right now. We do get into as much color theory as I can possibly get into in this class. How many people in here have had any color theory at all? As regards photography, not the color wheel that you painted in the seventh grade, because that's pigment, but light, color theory and light, how many? See, this is a huge problem. This is something that you guys depend on and deal with every single day, and yet the foundation hasn't been given to you. The foundation to be built for this ha is not there yet. So I'm going to change that part. But what I want to do now is sort of like jumpstart this, so hopefully you will believe in me enough to follow me down the yellow brick road. Hey, I love that attitude. Okay, so I'm going to show you one chart here <clears throat> that deals with color and flow and how we actually need to deal with it and the problems that we've got with it. So, does anybody in here ever shoot color negative film? Did anybody ever print color negative film? Well, the problem always with color negative film is that nobody ever knew what the print was supposed to look like. There was no reference for it. You shot it and then you printed it out and if it was too red, I mean, you would look at it and say, well, that's too red, but there was no inherent reference built into that. There was no way to know for sure that it was too red or that it was too blue. There was none of, the, none of that actually existed. So people just guessed. And that's how color printing existed forever. And in the digital world, it's in large measure the same way. When you guys look at a file that you're gonna print out, you go, well, it looks too red. And so you put a curve on it and you take some of the red out and you print another test. Story. You go through all of that, right? Isn't that what you do? Or do you just print something out and you accept the fact that it's fucking red and you say, I'm a fine artist. <laughs> That's my look. Stylistically, it's meant to be red. That's always an option, right? But I don't think that that's probably what you really want to do, right? I think probably what you would like to do instead is really have dependable, predictable color. And then if your style is too red, you can make all of your images too red at the exact same amount because you zeroed everything out to begin with. Does that sort of make sense what we're going for here? So I'm giving you the tricks to get to zero. We good on this? And you're actually going to build this thing. Now, at some point, I'm going to get this stuff into your hands to build one for your own. How many people, oh, I'm not gonna ask that. Most of you all have your own cameras, right? Okay, so we are going to tr put you in a position to trick this stuff out for your own cameras and for your own laptops and computers. How many people in here are, are working on laptops or doing most of their editing and everything on, on their own laptops? <coughs> okay, most of you guys. Occasionally you might come in and do something on one of these things, but most of you guys are working that way. So anyway, that's going to be moving forward, the plan that I'm going to go for here. So here's the trick and the problem in all of this. If you look at the way this chart works right here, what happens is this. If you're a film shooter and you're scanning film, this works as well. But for most of you guys, you're camera shooters. And what ends up happening is you've got an image that you take a picture of. And number one, you have no idea what the fucking color should be. So that's the first thing we need to deal with is you need to be able to color balance your images. The second thing, though, that we need to do is we need to deal with the fact that every one of your sensors is unique and interprets color in a completely unique way. So I know you've all, this is not so obvious with, with cameras, but you've all experienced this. You've all stood in front of the wall of TVs at Costco or at Best Buy or wherever the fuck you see the wall of TVs, and they all have different color. The reason they all have different color is they are all what we call device dependent, which means that they all have their own unique color. It's not just TVs, though. Your eyeballs are device dependent. Your eyes, actually, you, both of your eyes see color slightly different than the other one. But I can promise you that I don't see color the same way Bridget does, that I don't see, nobody in this room sees color the same way. So we have to come up with a way to standardize color, to eliminate the variability of device dependence. Does that make sense? So your cameras have a bias built into the sensor. We need to get rid of that. Your monitors have a bias that's built into them. We need to get rid of that. And then finally, your printers have a bias that's built into that. 
we need to get rid of that. If we can standardize those three things, we have predictable color. Does that make sense? So my first job is to standardize my file, to color balance my file. I'm going to show you how the true way to do that. My second one is I'm going to build a profile for my camera to deal with its bias, the way it looks at color, because it's unique, and I need to remove that uniqueness. I need to make it universal. Does this make sense? Are we good on this? Once I get that universal, I can bring it into Photoshop. Photoshop is a mathematical place. It does not have ambiguous color. It has unambiguous color. So if I can get it color balanced and the bias removed, when I get it into Photoshop, it's safe in here. And I can trade my files that are Photoshop files amongst everybody here. I could give it to you, I could give it to you, I could give it to you. And if you open it into Photoshop, at least in Photoshop, it is unambiguous. Because Photoshop is not a device. There is no dependence here. It is a mathematical model, and all of our Photoshops are identical. Does that make sense? However, then I get to the problem of output. Going out to a monitor, monitors reintroduce this device dependence and the bias. I need to get rid of that. I do that by calibrating this monitor and building a profile for it. Does that make sense? And then finally, when I go to print this thing, I do the exact same thing for my printers. I actually build profiles for every individual printer, every individual paper, and every individual ink set that I use. And if I go through all of this, then what I end up with is neutral, predictable color that comes in, neutral, predictable color that comes out to a monitor. Everybody's monitor will show this exactly the same because everybody has their own unique monitor profile that is controlling the bias of their monitor. Does that make sense? We good on this? And then finally, this output to printing. Every single printer will have its own unique profile, as well as individual papers. So if you print an Epson paper on this printer, an Epson Luster, and then you go to a Red River uh, Gloss, different profile, different bias. Does that make sense? So if I can get the biases out of all of these input devices, I have predictable color. And it doesn't fail. So are you guys ready to go down that road? Wow. The energy and the excitement is overwhelming. I'm like, OK, so we're going to do that. Just keep this in mind. OK, there is a file that you have on your desk called, um, <clears throat> let me get to my desk. You should be. Uh, wait, uh, doing it on your laptop, you probably don't have the software that you need. So do this. If you uh, only have a laptop, you're going to have to watch this. Um, the software that we do this with is free, though, so you can download the software. It's just we're not going to have time to wait for the software. The software does exist on these computers right here, though. So if you can get on one of these big computers and uh, grab that file really quick, you'll be good to go. Okay. So first things first. So again, this file was in our class projects, uh, and this file will exist. I'll leave this here for a while. So if you can't get it done today and you want to come in and you want to practice on this uh, during the week, you'll actually be able to do that. <clears throat> so it's the one called Sensor. Uh, sensor Profile Working File. I think that's what I called it. Where are you? Yep, right here. Sensor profile working file. It's a CR2 file. Does everybody have this guy who can work with it? Okay, on your desktop. If you simply double click on the file, it's going to launch this into Photoshop. Photoshop will start and it will bring it into Camera Raw. It should look like this. Oh, yours is asking to go into phase. Uh, hit, uh, <clears throat> you don't actually want to do any of that. You can just close that guy up. 
launch Photoshop. And then simply drag that raw file on top of the Photoshop icon. At the bottom. In the dash. Oh, it's there. You're there. You're there. You're in camera off. Okay, so high art. Right? So looking at this picture, is there anything wrong with it? Is the color okay? Do you know? Of course, you have no clue, right? None clue. So here's going to be the first thing that we actually do in this. If you zoom into this, <coughs> this is this thing that I've actually showed you, this color passport checker guy right here, this guy right here. Yeah, right? If you look up here at the top of the screen, so now this should be relatively new to most of you people. Well, no, actually most of you guys have experience in Photoshop, so uh, this also exists in Lightroom. You can do this exact same process in Lightroom. But if you look at the top of this, uh, um, uh, of our Adobe Camera Raw right up here, there's a series of icons. The third one in that looks like an eyedropper, not the eyedropper with a little star next to it, but the eyedropper right here, is the white balance tool. If you click on this, what Photoshop does is anything that you click on, by definition, white balance in Photoshop is equal amounts of RGB. Equal amounts of RGB generate a neutral gray. So most of you guys, well, I'll go back to this a little bit later, but nonetheless, we're going to just say equal amounts equal a neutral gray. So you can see right now, I'm going to actually hover over... Um, one of these, I'm going to hover over this middle gray guy. It's the one that's right next to the red. I'm going to hover this little guy over here. And if you look right underneath my histogram, we're getting a readout. This readout for RGB levels here, it says 197, 201, and 20, uh, 201 for that. Photoshop measures color on a scale from 0 to 255 in the red, green, and blue channel. How many people in this room are not aware of that? Okay, okay, so we'll get to that actually next week. We're going to talk about that scale. What I am going to say to you right now is that in Photoshop, zero represents black, 255 represents white. So what we are looking at with these numbers right here is that these are lighter values of this scale, of that amount of red, that amount of green, and that amount of blue. If I can get those numbers to be equal, my image will be color balanced if I do it on something that should be a neutral gray. Does that make sense? So I come down here and I'm actually going to click on that little gray patch that's underneath there. And you will see that it slightly changes the color of my image and it actually makes this a 201, a 200, and a 200, which is incredibly close. It's pretty close to begin with, but just to give you some idea, this image is now perfectly color balanced. This, by definition, is a neutral gray. These patches that run right along the bottom here, by definition, this thing scientifically built by definition, these are neutral grays. So by using that color sampling, the white balance tool, and clicking on that, this image is now color balanced. Now, you may say to me, well, it's fucking ugly as shit too, though. I like my film. I like my images really warm. That's fine. You can make your images warm. We will get to that in this class. But the point that I am trying to stress to you right now is that this is now perfectly neutral color. Actually, that's interesting you say. It doesn't really matter. You can actually click on uh, pretty much either the set. Uh, you can click on the one that's right above it or the one that's right below it. What a lot of people will say to you is you want to avoid the white patch because it can get so bright that it does not actually give you room to do this color balancing. So if one of the values levels in these RGBs is getting too close to that 255, you may not have enough room to actually do the color balancing, whereas working in those middle grays, you always will. And the other thing is that you will want to avoid the colors down here, even though they work, the darker colors, because color casting is picked up in what we call the midtones and the quarter tones. That's where you see color casting. You don't see, if I looked really red, you would know it in my face. You would never see it in my shirt. 
So that's the reason you actually want to pick those sort of more middle tones. Okay, so that's all great and good, but is the bias of my camera been taken into account for this? Do you know? Probably not. It hasn't been. So we are going to build the profile to do that. And you can do this for each and every one of your cameras, which you are going to do in this class. Change your life. Get your color under control. Win drinks at the bars because your loser friends are not going to know any of this shit. I'm telling you this right now. The other classes aren't going to get into this. Foundation <laughs> sure never got into this. There's no other place you're going to find this shit. You are going to be up here where all your loser buddies are going to be riding down here. And you just have to laugh and cry at the same time at how pathetic that situation is, but how lucky you are. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. We good? <laughs> Different thing. Okay, so we are going to fix this guy right now. To do this, right down here at the bottom on the left-hand side is this thing that says Save Image. You want to click on that. It's going to open up a dialog box, and it's going to allow you to build a DNG copy of this file, which is what you have to do. The software that does this runs only on DNGs. It will not work on a CR2, an NEF, or an ARW, or whatever the hell Sony is. You've got to build a DNG. If you don't change anything in this dialog box, and you simply hit save, it's going to put the DNG right next to the CR2 that you loaded to build this with. That's what this whole thing is about right here. You could change all this. There's no reason to change all this. I'm simply going to build this. So click on the word that says save. It'll actually do a little spinning guy down there to indicate that that's happened. And then you can actually hit the cancel dialog box right here. We don't need to do any more work with that guy. That part's actually done for us right now. And then you need to leave Photoshop, go back to your finder, go to your desktop. And on your desktop, you should have, what do we call that thing, sensor profile? You should have now a second file that's sitting right next to the CR2 called, same name, Sensor profile working file dot DNG. Who did not end up with that? Who can? So we good on that? Those. Isn't it? That's going to be my new naming convention. I'm fucking throwing the date thing out. I'm just going to do like random name shit like this and hope that I can remember it. Because yeah, my memory is only getting better with age. Okay, so next thing you need to do, and again, for you guys who are working on your laptops, you probably don't have this software. It's free to download. Um, there's links to it on our Canvas site. But if you're working on the computers that exist here, the software is loaded. You're looking for a thing called... Um, Color Checker Passport Software, and you need to launch that guy. And when you launch it, in my case, it gives me a warning about displays. Again, it's all about color managed workflow, and I'm just going to say, okay, yeah, I understand that. I do this part, whatever. I'm really good about this. There's two ways to get your file loaded into this. If you can see your finder at the same time, you can simply drag and drop that file onto it. So I'm going to go to my desktop. Again, it's not the CR2 file. It's the DNG you just made. So again, I'm going to grab this sensor profile working file dot DNG, and I'm going to drag it onto this guy, onto the window for the double check. It says it's loading the image. If that's too complicated for you, you can actually come up to the file menu and say add image and you can navigate to it. But in the end, you should end up, if you're lucky, with this. It has located this color target and it's actually put this set of squares around it. Again, these are known values. What's happening now to develop the profile is this. And this happens in everything that we're going to build profiles for. These are a set of known values. I photographed them with my camera. My camera has given me this file. The software is going to say, okay, how close to this did your camera get? 
and it's going to look at each one of these colors. And if it says, oh, well, the, 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 the red, the orangey one, it got perfect. But the green one, it's way off. It can measure how far off it is, and it can build a profile to take that bias out. Does that make sense? Who did I lose? So that's what's going to happen. The software now is going to measure the file that I gave it and say, okay, well, this was good, but this is awful. This is good. This is bad. This is mediocre. But, okay, I'm going to measure all of this out, and I'm going to give you the profile that will then correct for this and give you unbiased, undevice dependent color. Are we good on this? All right, so to do this, I am going to hit create profile. Um, if you didn't, if it didn't find the target, you can actually, let me cancel out this really quick. If it didn't find the target, you can actually use the um, uh, controls over here to zoom in and out of your image to move this thing around. If you click on these, you'll see it moves the, the sort of registration marks around that. You just want to make sure that it lands on this and that these little squares are all perfectly sitting inside of this. Uh, and then we're going to hit, uh, go ahead and uh, hit create profile. Now, in my case, it comes up and it just gives me this Canon EOS 5D Mark II. That doesn't really tell me a lot. What I really care about is the shooting that I've actually done this for. What would I use to ID that shooting? The same naming convention that I've used for everything else, right? So I'm going to hit cancel out of here really quickly to go find that naming convention. And I don't see it right here because I've renamed it, but I can click on it and give you a good guess as to what it is. What would you guys name this? Oh, it's re-tagged this as well. Let me do, look at my CR2 file. Um, that's also renamed it. Okay, we'll just go with this. What would you guys guess I should be naming this file? Two thousand eighteen oh two one seven underscore CCC also for Columbia College underscore. This is my retouching class. Good name, right? So that's what I'm going to name this thing. So the seventeenth. Okay, create profile. And instead of naming it this, I'm going to call it two zero one eight oh two one seven underscore. CCC underscore retouch. You get where this is going, guys? You build these. I build these for every shooting that I do. You don't have to build them for every because the bias is really in your sensor. But the more precise that you can be, my color is so on, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts my family. <laughs> So then, where this guy goes, you need to check this drop-down list. Look at this list. It's buried so deep, you can't believe it. But anyway, it's in Application Support, inside Adobe, inside Camera Raw, inside of Profiles. That's where this thing goes. And if you don't put it in there, you can't get access to it. So you just need to check to make sure. Usually, the software is really good about finding it there. Are we good on this? Who have I lost? I feel like I'm losing everybody. Shoot. Yes. Right. You don't have to. The more specific you can be, the better. The truth is the bias is built into your sensor, so it treats all light the same, but you will get really minor variations in different lighting setups. So if you're like me, I'm an absolute fanatic about this. I will make different profiles for different lighting. So the cloudy profile will be the cloudy one, and the bright sunny day one will be the bright sunny day one that's in the same day, in the same field, the same whatever that I'm shooting. But at least you have one, if you only can make yeah, one. Sometimes it's like on a gradient. Right. Like, but this doesn't have anything to do with the exposure. This is the bias of your sensor. Right. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and hit save on this because this is going into the right place. It's going to save this profile. It says, please wait to do this. I'm patient. I'm going to then say, okay. Then you can quit the color passport checker. You also need to quit Photoshop now because Photoshop is open. The profile is, um, it's, it's been loaded in the right place, but Photoshop is not aware of it because Photoshop loads all of these things when it opens up. 
So quit Photoshop. So I'm simply going to go into Photoshop, I hope. And quit. I'm going to relaunch Photoshop. I'm going to find this. Now, at this point, you don't want to open the DNG. It has done its work. For that matter, the DNG, you can throw it away. It, I don't need it anymore. It's right here. I'm going to pitch it. I only want to work with my CR2 file, but I'm going to drag that CR2 file on top of Photoshop. It's going to open it up. I'm going to zoom in. The first thing that I am going to do, though, is change my profile. Now, this used to be something that got buried way deep in Camera Raw. It also got buried way deep in Lightroom. It's become so important. They've actually brought it into Camera Raw, and it's sitting up front and center. It's right here, this profile. They all say Adobe Color. This is what Adobe thinks it should be. I'm going to click on my drop-down menu here, and you don't see the one I just made. You need to come down to Browse. It will open up a window where you can actually change different profiles. And as I start to scroll down here under Camera Raw, you will see the profile that I just built, I hope. Oh, sorry, profiles, not Camera Raw, profiles, this one down here. And it's the only one. It exists right here. Look at what happens when I hover over this guy. Look what happens to the sweater. Does anybody see a change? Does anybody see a huge fucking change? <laughs> How do you correct for that? Your whole life, you had no idea. What's happening for me, if you look at mine, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so you can see the colors. This is what Adobe thinks the color should be, but if I hover over this, look how much darker my blues get. My sensor is hypersensitive to blue light. It's registering more blue than is really there. That blue should not be there. That is a bias of my sensor. I have just built a profile to get rid of it. So I am going to then click on this now to apply that profile. Then I'm going to come back up to my white balance tool. I'm going to select that. I am going to click on this, and I have perfectly neutral, device-independent, predictable color. Let's yes. <laughs> Change your life, I promise you. This is a game changer, and I can also promise you, remember that whole conversation we had about what you do when you get out of Columbia College and what you do next? You go into a photo studio, and you say to the loser photographer there who graduated from Columbia before I started teaching, and you say to him, by the way, would you like me to generate a custom profile for your camera? And he goes, what? And you go, yeah, I can knock that out. You won't believe the difference it'll make in your color. And they'll go, um... Sure. And then they're going to go to their studio manager and say, you need to get that person back tomorrow. They know what they're doing. Game changer. Are there questions about this? All right, I'm going to show you this really quick because we've got hopefully 10 minutes that we can get it done. But this is how you do the camera stage of it. So again, what we have just done... is this phase right here. Camera profile through Adobe Camera Raw coming into Photoshop. Color corrected, color neutral. Now what we need to deal with is that, the monitor. That's the next problem that we've got in this. So to deal with the monitor, you actually need to use a different piece of software and a different piece of hardware. And it looks like this. There are two versions of this. This is critically important if you're going to do this. We are going to calibrate this monitor right now and build a profile for it. There are two calibrators available to you. There's the set that you can get from the room right up here, from the checkout up here. They're called Color Monkeys. 
They're shitty. Don't use them. The other one that you want to use is called an I1 profiler. It's made by the same company, but one of them costs 100 bucks. The other one costs 300 bucks. Now, just throwing this out there, which one do you think you want to use? The $300 one. It is called an I1 profiler. You have to get it from the fourth floor checkout down there. You can check these out. You can use them for up to two days, bring them back. How often do you want to profile your monitor? You want to profile your monitor every single time color matters to you. If you're just doing general editing, I would say profile your monitor once at least a week, once every two weeks, something like that. If you work for Pixar, you guys know who Pixar is? Conditions for employment. If you do not calibrate your monitor every single morning, it's cause to being fired. If you don't calibrate your monitor, they track it. If you don't calibrate your monitor, you're let go. You think it's important? So that's the part we're going to do really quick. Hopefully I'm going to be able to get through this and go through a quick set of notes. The uh, Again, all the notes are on our website about how to do this. The software, so anyway, the uh, the um, <clears throat> the um, Color Passport Checker software is free for download. Um, this software that you use for this guy comes on a little jump drive that's sitting right in here. You can also download this directly from uh, um, the x right people, but you'll never find it. They have 100,000 versions of this software. You'll never find it. Just use the jump drive from here. Once you get the software installed and you run it, it's going to ask you if you want to update to the latest greatest. I go ahead and update mine. But you guys, I mean, that's typical. You guys do all that kind of stuff anyway. So this is what it looks like. It'll be, it'll load this thing called I1 Profiler. If you double click on, oh, and a, just a note, you want to plug this thing in before you launch the software. Otherwise, it gets confused. <clears throat> so I1, this opens up. This is the first thing that you're going to see. Actually, I take that back. I was already into this, so I want to make sure you guys see what you should see. <clears throat> Who can sing the Jeopardy song? Thank you. Okay, this comes up. We can profile a huge number of things. We can pro projectors, scanners, printers, all that kind of stuff with the software. We are going to do display profiling because it's this monitor. You'll see that I've actually got two options here. The reason I've got two options is because one of them, it's going to let me do this projector if I want to do it. But instead, I'm going to do my color LCD. That's what I want to pick. These are the important things you need to know. You either need to write this down now or you need to open up the, the PDF that I gave you because this matters. What we're going to do here for the white point, there is a drop down menu here. You need to set your illuminant to D65. That stands for D, uh, daylight is the D. The 65 stands for 6500 degrees Kelvin which by all standards now throughout the world is considered to be neutral white. It used to be in the U.S. They had 5,500. Most people consider that too warm. Europe and Asia always had 6,500. The U.S. has now joined everybody else. So D65 for that. In terms of the brightness value of this, that's what luminance is right here. This is something that you have to adjust using the brightness control on your computer. We'll get to how that works. For me, you want to set this at 120 candelas uh, uh, per squared meter. You'll see there's a drop-down menu here. Most people will put it between 120 and 140. That's the target range you're going for. 180 is too dark. This 160 and 250 is too light. Some people will say do this native. You do not want to do that. Stick in that 120 to 140 range. This ends up being an option for me. In terms of the gamma response, this is also something that has been standard. You want to do a gamma of 2.2. What gamma is, it's a curve. Everybody in this room is familiar with curves in Photoshop, right? Or curves in Lightroom. Curves control the tonal response. They allow you to increase or decrease contrast. It's the same thing here. The contrast curve, gamma curve, you want to use 2.2. Again, there's special reasons that you might want to use something else, but for us, it's always going to be 
the last thing and two things that are important right here is this ambient light control. Do you know that your computer actually changes how bright and dark it is depending on the room light? You want to turn that off. We are trying to shut your color down. If you leave that on, your computer is changed. Every time somebody turns on a light, your computer changes what you see. How do you edit when all of a sudden somebody turns a light on and your blacks are no longer black? They're now dark gray. And then they turn the light off and your blacks are black again. Not a good option. So anyway, you need to make sure that this adjust profile based on your ambient light is not checked. However, you also need to go up here to your Apple menu, down to System Preferences, down to Displays, and you will see that right here, Automatically Adjust Brightness is an option you have as a system preference. You've got to turn it off there as well. And if you don't, your computer owns you. I want your computer to be your bitch, not the other way around. What was it you used? Trick-ass trick bitch. I want your computer to be your trick-ass bitch, not the other way around. <laughs> so once these things are set up like that, I'm going to hit the next button right here, and it's actually going to show me a screen of colors. This is just like, it's a different set of colors, but this is not too dissimilar to what was going on right here. So what's going to happen is, is that the software is going to kick out all of these colors. This little hardware puck that we plugged in is going to measure them. Whatever is perfectly the same, it won't touch, but whatever is bias, it's going to build the definition of bias to eliminate the bias. Does that make sense? Are we good on this? Okay. So to do this, um, I'm going to hit next again. Actually, I'm not going to hit next again. I'm going to hit start measurement. It's at the bottom right here. So start measurement. This will walk you through what it says it wants you to actually do. So it gives you little things. It's going to say, if you can't see this, stand up. Take this little thing. There's a protective cover on it and twist it around so that instead of looking through the um, uh, white plastic, you've actually got the lens. That's what you need to have. Then this lens is going to go on your uh, screen. There's a counterweight right here that slides so that you can slide this down so that it stays tucked against your screen like that. You should also tilt your screen back so that this thing has solid contact on it. Does that make sense? We good with this? Then I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that and then hit Next. And you'll see what ends up happening. We're not going to have time to watch this all because I've got three minutes left. But you'll see what's happening is the first thing it's going to do is measure my brightness. And it's going to say my target is 120 and I'm at a 370. My monitor is too fucking bright. So I'm going to start just tapping down my monitor. And you can see it's changing the measured brightness. And again, I get down to 121. This is at 111. I'm going to go back up. I'm now at 112. I'm in that 138. I'm in that range between 120 and 140. My brightness has now been set. How fucking bright is that? You don't know. So you whip out your cell phone. You get your camera ready. You hit this down one and then back up one and shoot a picture of that really quick. And you'll know how many of those little bars are supposed to be on your brightness slider so that you can reset your brightness to what you actually did for your profile every time you want to work on it. I know, it's clunky, but it's the best I've got. <laughs> Does this make sense? So now I've set the brightness. I'm going to hit next. And now the only thing that happens is it's going to start flashing tones and color. So the software knows what color is actually supposed to be. You can actually see it. It's coming up in these reds right now. It'll start flashing a whole series of greens and blues. The software is measuring what the, the puck is measuring it and building the difference. Does this make sense to all of you guys? It's going to go through all of this. You're going to get to the end, and you're going to say, save the profile. Uh, I, I'm going to wait. It says that it's only going to... Well, no, we've got a ways to go because this is going to take, I'm at a 20 out of 118. I need to ask you guys questions right now about the assignment for next week, about anything that we've gone over in class. 
so how many people are saying to themselves right now, I didn't sign up for this. Shoot. Yes. Nothing. You can't do this to your images. But we're going to get into this. Well, I understand. I was just saying. Okay. Are we good on this, guys? Oh, thank, thank you. you. I feel Good. Like, I feel like there was just a bunch of stuff dumped in my brain on top of that and it got lost. Well, that's the part that I'm wanting to address right now is I, 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 at a certain stage of the game, if you get a, if you track the course of tonight, it's a lot. All I can say to you is, is and I say this, I promise this to everybody, whatever. I will get you through this. If you promise me you will do the work, I will get you through this. I will change everything about how you ultimately build your images. That I can promise you, and it will be for the best. It takes time, and it takes knowledge, but I can get you there. Just stay with me, okay? All right. Um, you guys should go, because this is going to take too long. Um, I'll show you this at the very end. I'll actually, um, I can leave this running, so you're welcome to stay and see what happens. I've got... Still about 40 of these to go. Um, or I will leave it on. You will be able to see it on the video. Or we will pick this up at this point um, next week. All right, you guys are good? All right, I'll see you next week. Oh, and did, yeah, I did. It's fucking raining, Roger. Yeah, I'm just cereal. Maybe we could go over this, but I was wondering if you could do, like, color perfect at all. Yeah, okay. I know it's not like. Are you, do you scan class. stuff or do you? I do, yeah. Okay, yeah, no. That may be something that we do as a one off. We'll see That's, if anybody else in the class is interested and get together sure. during the week. That'd be kind of cool. Because yeah. I, I was using it all last semester. Right. I don't know if I'm prolific. Do me a favor, shoot me a quick email about that because the grad, they, they're bringing in, like, the color perfect guy is coming in to talk to the grad department. From. Um, yeah, from wherever. Lam area yeah, whatever. Uh, and I can get you into that okay. um, session, and that, that would cool. actually be better. Yeah. Okay. Well, shoot me an email and I'll do it. Are Dude. you talking about okay. scanning color film? Yeah, yeah. with color perfect. Same. Okay. Same, same, same. Cool. Shoot me an email about that because again, the guy like there's a guru who does this who's uh, doing a demo for the grad department. Um, I saw it last semester; it was really well, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you guys showed up for it. Okay. It's a small group. Oh, okay. okay. All right. We're there. Hi. Hi. Just so you know, they're writing me a lovely accommodation letter. Oh yeah. Um, that says I can't really walk. Okay. To miss a day of class. For a follow-up appointment. Okay. That's all it says, really. Okay. For this assignment, if it's okay, I'm just probably going to break it up into several oh, things okay. of walking instead of one. You know what you might do? What might oh. I do? <laughs> I can. No, I'm thinking about doing something completely different. Can you do that yes. in your house? Okay. Don't go outside. Okay. Yeah. The drifting, you'll have to use a little, a little imagination. You know, but it might be interesting to do. I there, there was a guy I went to school with who, um, um, he had a really horrible, I want to say it was diabetes, and he would be bedridden for like months at a time, and he shot entire bodies of work in his bed, in his bedroom. Never got out. It was some of the most compelling work you have ever seen, whatever. And it was just, his world was just incredibly restricted, but he could still function within it. So... Um, I, I, I take all sorts of liberty. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi. I love you too. So for this, uh, assignment, yes. So there's like five here. Right. You only need to do two. So just choose Anyone? two drifts mm -hmm. and yeah. take so 40 pictures? You'll shoot 40, but I'm only going to look at, you'll show the class 20 or 30, but I'm only going to look at 10. So at the end, if you go down to the very end. Down here. At the end, what you're going to show next week is. Also, is that 200 images? Yeah, 20 images. Category. So you're going to shoot 40 and show 20. You get to edit. Okay, shoot 40 and. And pick. Pick 20. Mm -hmm. And. Category. And then. We're going to do. We'll next, do next week. The beginning of. Yeah. Class. Yes. Just uh, take uh, take forty pictures with cell phone yep. and pick twenty. Yes. And 
no edit at all. Exactly. Exactly. All right. See ya. Oh, uh, the easiest thing uh, to go to is go to YouTube and search for Verser, V-E-R-S-E-R. -E -E yes. Yes. I will put it up there probably tomorrow. And it'll have a name. The name it'll have, it'll have um, Photo Practice 3 Fall 2018 um, Session 1. That's what it'll be called. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you just need to go to Verser when you get to YouTube and then look at my channel. Just me? Yeah. Yep. You good? You good? Yeah. And if you can't find it, send me an email and I will copy the link and I'll email the link back to you. Okay. And you can go, you'll click on it, you'll go right there. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure.